So it's my understanding right now that you are in a series called uh, Free Done, where you're talking about the freedom that you get from having a relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so I want to I talk about that today, but I want to talk about that uh, in, in relationship to your relationship to God. I want to talk about how you now, because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for you, you now are free to relate to God in a whole new way. And so first, uh, because of Christ's work, the text that I just read, right at the beginning, it said, therefore there is now no what? Condemnation. Uh, what does condemnation mean? What is it? Well, one might be able to say um, charged with guilt, that you are punished, that you are sentenced. If someone is brought into a court of law and they are condemned, that means they're put away in jail or maybe even in some states uh, assigned the death penalty for their crime. To be condemned is bad news. It's never something that you want to hear attached to your name. Now, um, there are a couple ways that you and I, that every single human being naturally uh, sort of relates to God in our sinful self. Like from birth, the way we kind of naturally relate to God. Uh, the first one, which I think is most common in the culture, is to sort of see God, by the way, most people believe there is a God, most people believe there's someone or something, but what they think about him is they think that he's sort of, he's sort of like the, the really gentle grandpa God. He's that, he's, he, you know, he, he might tell a corny joke every once in a while, uh, he might be, just, but he's generally just really into you. He's really into you. He really thinks that you're something special, that he doesn't really have too much of a problem with your sin. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Every, no one's perfect. We're all just human beings. Um, I don't know if you know much about what I'm doing, but right now I'm in the middle of planting a church in the middle of Manhattan in New York City, so I'm, I'm sort of right in the heart of New York City. And what I spend my days doing is, uh, for the most part, going up and talking to strangers without freaking them out or making them think that I'm some sort of cultish weirdo. Um, and when I go talk to them, I ask them questions related to spirituality, related to faith. And, uh, and usually, in the 200 plus conversations I've had, uh, at some point or another, the topic of eternal things will come up. The topic of heaven and hell will come up. And if you had to guess, how many people think that I have met in New York City that they are going to heaven? The answer would be nearly all of them. Nearly all of the people I've met believe that they are indeed on their way to heaven. And the reason they, they say that is because they, they sort of, they logically deduce something. They say, okay, I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I know I got wasted last night. I know I've done things that aren't right. No one's perfect, but man, I ain't that dude. And I'm not as bad as that girl. And so we can always find somebody that's more of a villain than us, and so we logically deduce, therefore, my good will outweigh my bad, and when I stand before God or whatever it is that governs this world, he'll look at me and he'll say, ah, come on in. Grandpa God will go, come on in. That's one way, and I think that's primarily like if the culture thinks about God at all, they assume that he's just the guy that will greet them on their way into the eternal shopping mall. Now, there's another way. There's a second way that, uh, that sinners naturally relate to God. And this, I think, is more common in the church. I think this is a pretty common way. And that is that we sort of revert back a lot to thinking that God is really disappointed 
and angry with us most of the time. That he looks at your life and he sees the way that you think about somebody, that nasty thought that you had about someone, or the things that you did on your laptop that no one else saw you do, but he saw, and you think he looks at you with consistent disappointment and even anger. That's, I, I have met many Christians that view God as sort of this disappointed judge. Uh, there was a movie that came out in the 80s long before you were born, long before most of you were born. And uh, in this movie called Crimes and Misdemeanors, this guy, the main character, he commits a murder. And, uh, and after he commits the murder, he has this, for a little while, he has this like intense guilt about what he's done. I mean, you know, he murdered someone. And, uh, and, and he has this dream where he thinks about God. He thinks about what will happen if he stands before God. And in this dream, he's running and running and running. And God is pictured as this gigantic eyeball that is chasing him that he can't escape from. Now, some of you, some of you have that view just sort of naturally. You're, when you think of God, you don't think, you think, you don't think of the grandpa that's just genuinely friendly and thinks you're great, but you think of a God who's sort of disgusted with you and is just waiting for a time to get you. And listen, there's some truth to that. Like, there's some truth to the idea that God is a judge and that he does see all. That's true. And apart from faith in Jesus Christ, that eyeball does watch you and is seeing you as judge. That is, there is some truth to that. But, if we think about what Jesus has done through his life, death, and resurrection, when we understand the gospel of Jesus' finished work for us, Neither of the options I mentioned above are entirely true. They can't be the whole story. They can't be. Because on the one hand, it's impossible to believe that God just winks at our imperfections and sins because our imperfections and sins so offended him that Jesus had to suffer and bleed his very own son. That's not winking at sin. That's death at sin. And yet, on the other hand, on the other hand, it's impossible to those who trust Christ to believe that God is constantly angry and disappointed with you. Why? Because the Bible says that when you believe in Jesus, it's as if you are completely covered by him. And so, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sins, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus covering you, and therefore, you are a completely accepted and loved son or daughter of the King. So you're not condemned. In your relationship to God, you don't have to fear that anymore. You're a son, you're a daughter, and you have access to his throne. But there's a second thing that you're free from in your relationship to God, and that is you're, you're free from deceiving yourself about yourself. You're free to be honest. You're free to be honest with God and with others. Um, when you understand what Jesus has done for you on the cross is truly enough, is truly enough, well, guess what happens? It frees you, it frees you to just admit that, yes, you are a sinner. Yes, you're not perfect. You can be brutally honest. Now, again, where I'm, where I'm at right now in New York City, um, New, does anybody, has anybody been to New York City before? I know a few of you came out there um, uh, a little while back and visited me. Uh, if you've been out there, it, um, some of you might be from the East Coast. If you've spent any time on the East Coast, you will know that one of the values of New York City is brutal honesty. I mean, it's, it's just a, people are blunt and people will, t like, I can't tell you how many times I've walked up to somebody to start a conversation with them and they said, take a hike. You know, you just like put your tail between your legs, like, okay, you know. Um, but that's real, that's real. There's a, there's a brutal honesty there. If somebody disagrees with you, they'll tell you, no, you're, you're, you're crazy. That's not true. And they'll argue it out with you. They'll argue it out with you. There is something really refreshing about that to me. 
There's something really refreshing about knowing where someone stands. In your relationship to God, you don't have to pretend. You don't have to put on the fake face when you pray. You don't have to put on the fake smile when you walk into church. You don't have to fake it in your relationship to God. You can be real. You can be authentic. You can tell him about the worst of the worst. Because guess what? He knows. He's already seen it. He knows everything. And because of Jesus, he doesn't turn his face away from you. And he doesn't blink. But he sticks with you. Now, what we naturally do with our sin, instead of being honest about it and coming, just coming right out about it and saying, I blew it and this is what I did, we do, we do one of two things. Uh, we naturally either excuse our sin. That's the first thing. We excuse our sin. I have, uh, I have three little, little sinners living in my house, known as my children. Um, three boys, 11, 10, and 4. They're, they're good boys. I mean, I, I, you know, they're good boys. But they're sinners. Do you know how many excuses I hear on any given day for their sinful behavior? I mean, it's, it's endless. And I'm willing to bet if you ask any parent in this room, you'll hear the same kind of thing. My, I, my 11 and 10 year old, they're best friends and worst enemies all day. I mean, they're a year apart. So uh, they're about the same size. So that means it's pretty much a fair fight. Whenever they fight, like no one wins. They just both beat each other to shreds. It's just the way it goes. And every time, if I ask the very foolish question, why did you do this? If I ask my son, why did you punch your brother? I'm not going to get the answer, Father, my sinful nature was inflamed and I felt like punching my brother. It was because I had the sin welling up inside of me and I just had to, I am sorry, dear Father. No, what I'm going to get is, he took my game, he took my game. And so what he is saying is, I am justified. My sin was right. It's okay. Now, that doesn't end, I wish it did, but that doesn't end in childhood. As you grow into adulthood, you will find that you will have the same impulse to want to make excuses for your sin all the time. It's, it's part of this sinful nature that's still dragged around with us that we're going to want to make excuses or blame shift or put blame on someone else. That's what Adam and Eve did when they first sinned in the garden. You remember? God comes to Adam and what does he say? Well, if you hadn't given me this woman, this woman, she was the one who took the fruit. And then he goes, you know, Eve, why? And Eve's like, well, it's, it's, it's the snake. You know, it's the serpent. If you hadn't put him there. And they're all blame shifting. No one's taking responsibility. That's one way of handling our sin. And it's very popular in our culture. But another way, again, more common, I think, in the church is to hide it. To hide our sin. That's also what Adam and Eve did. First thing they did after they sinned. What do they do? Sew some clothes. They're filled with shame because they see each other's nakedness. They sew some fig leaves. They go try and hide. I find that to be one of the most comedic events in all of the Bible's uh, history. They're like the sovereign, omnipotent, all-knowing, all-seeing God who created the universe with his word is going to be like, oh, I can't see him. There's fig leaves. I don't know what I'm going to do. But this is, the, this is the craziness of sin. This is the, cra the, cra the irrational insanity of sin is that you think you can hide with some fig leaves from God. And it never works. And as a matter of fact, it's really bad for you. Do you know that there's been studies done that say uh, that hiding your sin or keeping secrets actually has a physical effect on you? It's actually so, so stressful things in your life Actually, keeping secrets is a stressful thing. Keeping your sin hidden is stressful. And so it actually, it actually weighs you down. It actually weighs you down. There's numerous studies showing this. Now, now, I don't know about you, but too often in the church, too often in our circles in the church, we're made to feel one way or the other, purposely or not, that we have to put our best face forward. That we have to act like everything is okay. And that only increases the more you grow into adulthood. There's this sort of pressure that everything has to seem right. But before the vertical standing with God, before the eyes of God, you don't have to pretend. You can confess. You can get real. You don't have to pretend it's not sin. You don't have to excuse it. And you don't have to blame anybody else. And you don't have to hide it. 
that you can be real with him. And he's not going to turn away. He's not turning away. 1 John 1, 8 through 10 says, If we say we have no sin, this is speaking to Christians. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In preparation for my time here today, I googled uh, confession. I, could, I googled confessional websites. Um, you can find a ton on Google if you didn't know. As an old person, it's a great resource. Uh, you ever heard of? You guys have heard of Google? Okay. Um, so, I Google confessional websites. I don't know if you know what these are. These are just websites where people are confessing their sins. They're confessing their problems. They're not confessing it to anyone. They're just writing it on, uploading it to a website and leaving it there anonymously, namelessly. Let me give you a few examples of these confessions. First one. I have three wonderful children and a man who loves me, yet most days I think of running away. I love my family, but so often I feel trapped in a life I have no control over. I care for them all without fail, and while I love what I am, I feel like I could be so much more. The guilt kills me, but I can't help what I feel. Am I a horrible person? Here's another. I'm addicted to pain pills. I've spent thousands of dollars on my habit. My tolerance is so high that I now take 480 milligram oxycodone or 10 methadone tablets plus 610 milligram Percocets. It wasn't so long ago that I messed up really bad and not paying attention to how high I was, I nearly died. I nearly OD'd. The thing is, I don't want to give up my habit at any cost, even my own death. For someone who does as much as I do, you would barely know it to look at me, except on occasion when I start nodding off in business meetings. But in my heart, I hold an enormous guilt at the thought of what my death would do to my mom, my brother, my friends that love me. And I have guilt to God for needing an out from a life I can't stand to live but, not, but don't dare to end. Signed, Anonymous. Last one. I cannot accept myself for being a lesbian. I hate myself. I hate my life. These websites are filled to the brim with people confessing stuff like this and way, way, way worse. Anonymously. How pathetically sad this is. Do you know, why are they doing that? Why are they confessing to a computer, to, a, to the internet, anonymously? Because they know they have to get it out. But here's the sad thing, it's not going to work. It's not going to salve their conscience. It's not going to bring what they need, which is the forgiveness of sins. Only Jesus can do that. And here Jesus is saying, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Confess your sins. I'm faithful and just to forgive you completely. So you don't have to excuse your sin. You don't have to hide it. I remember when I, was, when I first realized this, I was about 15 years old. I, was, I just started attending a youth group. I went to the youth group with, um, with one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to get a girl that was going to the youth group. That was it. I had no faith at the time. I, uh, I walked in, I never got the girl. She laughed at me and thought I was a joke. But I started listening to what the pastor was saying. After a long enough time of hearing what the pastor was saying about sin and salvation, I think it started to sink in. And they asked me to start helping them out, doing things around the church. And one day, one day I was sent out with a group of people to go put flyers on doors for the church. And so I'm out on the street with, a, with my partner in, uh, in the, the, uh, the work. And we're each on one side of the street putting on flyers. And all of a sudden a question pops in my mind. Eric, are you a sinner? And, and of course up until that time I knew I was a sinner. Of course I'm like, yeah, yeah you know, no one's perfect. I, I did the thing that I told you about at the beginning. But this time when that question came into my mind, I thought, I am a sinner and I felt afraid 
I felt afraid of what that meant if I ever stood before God. I knew, I knew that I could not be who I was and make it. The next, right after that, another question popped in my mind. Eric, do you need a savior? And instantly, yes, I need a savior. Yes, I know who that savior is because of what this guy at the youth group has been telling me. It's Jesus. And it dawned on me, I, I think I'm becoming a Christian. I think that's what's happening here. And so I sat down, I put my flyers on the floor, I sat down at the end of the cul-de-sac, and my partner sees me sitting down there and put my flyers down, and she's like, what's up with that, bro? So she comes up and she's like, um, what are you doing? And I said, I, I think I just became a Christian. And she went, oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, a little bit my pay grade, you know, kind of thing. And then she went, uh, you know, good for her. She said something so right. She was like, well, do you want to pray? And me, still really not knowing how these things worked, I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't, I don't need to pray. I'm good. But it was there I had become a Christian. Like, I knew I was a sinner. I was honest about my sin. I was real about it. I knew everything that I had done needed to be forgiven, and Jesus was the answer to that. And it's the same for you. And because of that, because of that, because you're free to be honest, because you're free from condemnation, you're forgiven, guess what? Sin's power is taken away in your relationship to God. The more you focus on the finished work of Jesus for you and all he's done for you, the less desire you'll actually have to live in sin and the more desire you'll have to obey what he says. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't hear this as, once you become a Christian, it's just up, up, up and away to heaven that you'll never struggle with sin. No, you will. For the rest of your life, to your dying breath, you will struggle with sin. It'll be a part of who you are. But, but here's the deal. The more you meditate on what Jesus was willing to do for you, it changes you, it changes your desires, and it makes you want to live more and more a life of obedience. It's like the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 2. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Or as the text said that I read at the beginning, you have been set free from sin's power. You don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to give in to those temptations. You have a way out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, you don't have to do it. You don't have to. Here's what happens when you, you, start, when you start, when you're living life more focused on what Jesus has done for you and your desires begin to change, you start to want to live according to the way God's designed you. And the way God's designed you is, is shown uh, through his commands and in, in his word, and you start wanting to do that more. But if, if that doesn't happen, then you're never going, you might technically be free already because you have faith in Jesus, but here's the deal, you won't feel free when you're sinning. You'll feel like you're in jail. You'll feel enslaved but you're not you don't have to you don't have to you're not enslaved you're free to walk away at any time from the things that get you down and from the things that cause you to stumble you're free to obey God and serve your neighbor I had a when I was like early 20s I got I think it was my first car that I ever owned it was a Volkswagen Fox um, Volkswagen Foxes are not foxy cars they are not um, they are not particularly awesome automobiles. Uh, but it was a car, and at that age, to get around was, was great in Southern California. That's where I'm from originally. Uh, so uh, I, didn't, I don't know anything about cars, and I don't care about cars. I just want them to, like, to drive me the, to places, and I'm still that way. I, I could care less about them. So uh, the problem with that is that if you don't do maintenance on cars, then they, they, they do bad things. So I didn't, I didn't change the oil in my Volkswagen Fox for a long time. <laughs> a long time. And one day I'm driving down the freeway, driving down the freeway, and I hear this pop. And I'm like, hmm, I don't think that's what's supposed to, what it's supposed to do. So I get out, 
and I, uh, I open up the hood and there's all this steam coming out. And, um, and so besides the oil being really bad, I, the radiator was, was completely shot. Now, now here's the thing, here's the thing. The instruction manual for the car was in my glove compartment. I had access to it any time. All I needed to do was look in there like what happens, you know, when a radiator goes bye-bye. And, uh, and it would have said like, so first thing is don't pour water into the radiator when it's steaming. It's not good for it. You know, like don't, don't do that. It actually says in there, don't do it, dummy. Um, but I didn't look at the instruction manual. <laughs> so I went inside and I got a jug of water and I'm just like goo 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 and then and then I heard a really big pop and then I tried starting my car again and I couldn't pop it and it turned out that I had blown my head gasket and now I don't even know what that means because like I said I don't know anything about cars but apparently that means that your car won't work anymore ever like that's basically the way that thing rolls is like it's just done it's just like oops you destroyed your car what are you gonna do? So I destroyed my car. Um, I called my called my father. I called my father with what I had done because I hadn't acted in line with the design for the car. And my dad, what did he say? He said, "Did you look at the instruction manual for the car?" And I said, "No, no, I did not, father. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. I'm sorry." And he said, it's all right, it's all right. We'll, we'll figure out how to get you another car. Now, here's why I'm telling you this story, not just because I like thinking about my folly. Um, here's why I'm telling you this. There's gonna be times where you don't act in line with what the instruction manual tells you. There's gonna be times where you're not acting in line with how you were designed. And there's going to be times where you might pop, where you might blow it big time, you might blow your head gasket, and you might think that it's the end, but you can always go back to your father, and your father will always, will always receive you, will always essentially say, we'll get another car. We're going to figure it out. You don't have to, you don't have to blow things up. You're not bound to that. So let me just uh, close this right now. If you're, if you're struggling with sin, um, and if I was to take a show of hands and say, how many of you are struggling with sin? The proper response would be for you all to raise your hand, including myself. Like, how many of you are struggling with sin? Yes, that's correct. And how many of you may not feel very free at all from condemnation or free to be honest or free from sin? Well, again, that might be a good chunk of us in here. Here's, here's what I'm going to tell you to do. Here's my, my big golden ticket at the end of this, this talk. I'm going to tell you to do the same thing that you were told to do at the very beginning of your relationship to God, whether it was in your baptism or whether it was just yesterday. Go back, repent, and believe. Just confess your sins to Jesus. Just confess. Just be honest on your own. And trust that His salvation is enough for you to truly have a great relationship with God. I have a quick story. Some of you heard yesterday uh, about a guy, and uh, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. What time are you guys finished? Okay. Um, so I I met this um, I met this guy at uh, in in San Diego on the streets in San Diego. He was a gay man. He was working for an LGBTQ magazine. Uh, then he was rushing around back and forth in front of me. I didn't know who he was, and so I stopped him. Uh, as he was rushing around and I asked him I said what you know where are you heading and he told me I'm working for this magazine and I'm trying to get it to uh, to the printer before midnight tonight and I said okay uh, well uh, what what kinds of issues are you facing in the magazine and he and he told me some of the issues and we had a conversation for quite a while and it came out in this conversation that he was born and raised in the church that he was uh, that his dad was an elder that his mom was the church secretary that he was um, he even went to Bible college for a little bit. I mean, straight up like Christian kid, Christian family. Anyhow, by this time, he's a young gay man living in a relationship with another man. So, I asked him, how, how do we go from Bible college to where you're at now? 
And this is why I, I, my relationship with my dad was scarred. Uh, it was awkward, and it still is today. Uh, and I just never felt loved or accepted by him. And then he said a second thing. He said, I just felt because of my sinful desires that I couldn't quite beat them, that I couldn't quite deal with the struggles, that I, that I had these desires, that God must have turned his back on me, that he must have turned his back on me, and that's why I, I have the desires I do. And I said to him, I, I, have to, I have to break in here. I have to interrupt you. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm a pastor. I'm not trying to hide that from you, but I... I just I need to tell you, you know, you said you, you think God turned his back on you, but God did not turn his back on you, but he did turn his back on his son for you so that he could be the father that you always wished you had. And as I said that, the man, the man began to weep. By this time it was about midnight, downtown San Diego, or actually a little later than that, and he's he's just bawling. And he says to me, I I growing up in church, I never heard that before. Growing up in church, I never heard that before. Now, I know you hear that here. I know you hear that at the school. But I want you to hear it again. You are free. You are free. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for these students. I pray that they would live a life free from condemnation, free from uh, free from uh, the, the, the fakeness and the deception that we can do for ourselves and free from, uh, the, uh, free from sin's power over their life. I pray that you'd give them uh, constant meditation on your word, Jesus, so that they would walk with a sense of confidence in their relationship to you and into others. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.